I love medieval shields, so let's build one of the most beautiful, underrepresented, but difficult one. <laughs> With that I mean this Tarchi from 1490, which is in the Wallace collection. And of course I'm only gonna use the original materials. First we're gonna have to carve the shape, then we'll add a bit of rawhide or leather, that's a different topic, we'll talk about that later. Then we're gonna add our self-made chalk base coat, followed by some polymand and gilding. So let's start with the shape. For that I choose Poplar. It's easy to carve and has been used originally. Just look at that. That'll be a hell of a job. <laughs> As you can see the three boards got a different cross section. That's why I cut it out of cardboard and now I can emulate how to assemble them best. Now it seems like we would have some holes here and so on. But in fact the photography wasn't taken directly from the side so I've got a bit of interpretation. And in addition the following layers already have been applied here. So it will get a bit bigger anyway. And if you got like some small holes here in the middle I can just fill it with scrap pieces. In order to assemble the pieces we'll use some cheese glue or casing glue. I already soaked it in water and let it sit overnight. And now we can add the marsh lime. Now follows one of the most difficult parts, which is the carving of course. This good boy here weighed 7 to 8 kilograms and we're gonna have to remove most of it. It's so difficult because you have to keep the difficult shape in mind all the time. Otherwise you'll remove some parts that better should have stayed on. As you can see it's already taken shape, but now my electric planer smells a bit like burnt plastic. So I guess I'm gonna switch to the edge grinder now. In addition it's time to work on the crevices and that's somewhere we can't reach with the electric planer and need the edge grinder anyway. On the other hand it's very dusty so I'll need a lot of protection layers. Let's just see how far I can get in the remaining two hours I have for today. Come on. In order to measure the thickness I'm using this caliper which I set to 3 cm and while keeping in touch with the front side of the shield I can measure its thickness. 1.9 kg, that means I grinded down more than 5 kg of poplar wood. Whoa! After cleaning the four buckets of sawdust up, there's only one final step we need to do in order to finish the wooden core, which is the orbital sander. And I only need ear protections for that and every piece of dust gets soaked in immediately. Mwah. Oh. And there we go, you know, I can imagine like when you're sitting on a horse and you got that as a shield right in front of you. Here you got the lance. It fits actually quite good already. I want to know how heavy it is. <laughs> 1.6 kilogram. Amazing. It's so beautiful. But you know, when one problem gets solved, another one rises. And in this case, the next step is stringing it. And for that, we're going to use authentic thin rawhide. Of course, only with authentic glue. Right behind me in a water bath, skin glue gets heated to 60 degrees Celsius. It's mixed in a proportion to one to four. With water, I let it sit overnight so that it can soak it in properly. And now we will apply the first layer and that's always so beautiful to look at. <laughs> I spent hours and hours looking at the pictures of the original and I haven't spotted a single seam. Mm. My theory behind this is that they maybe only did a very tiny overlap at the edge. So that's what I'm gonna try. Although I matched the shape pretty good, I'm sure you noticed that I didn't add the ridges yet. That's because they are so small, if we would try to string the rawhide above them, it would just get stretched apart. We would have air pockets around them and that's why I decided to apply them after we did the base coat on the front. That's like in four steps from now, so don't mention it till in a few for you minutes, for me weeks.
And now we're gonna wait a few hours till this is fully cured and then we can continue with the rawhide. I think that's the first time I'm working with rawhide in one of my videos. So let me give you an overview. You can see now it's quite hard, but if you put it in water, it will be soft, like very soft leather. It's only the pure dried skin of an animal and therefore we've got a meat and a hair side. In addition, I choose a very thin one because the shield's shape is so strange and difficult. With a thicker one, we wouldn't have a chance. A common mistake is that it gets soaked for too long. We want it to be as dry as possible and not wetter than necessary. That's because the wetter it gets, the more its size increases and therefore when it dries it'll shrink again and then it could deform the shield extremely. And that's why we only want to soak it for like two or three minutes now because it's so thin. You know, like really, really thick rawhide needs more than one day. This one out of a sheep will need minutes. Can you see how smooth it is already? Now we gotta determine which is the inside, the meat side and the outside where the hair was growing. Because it's important that we connect the meat side to the shield. When the rawhide is thicker, it's easy to determine. But here we gotta look for certain aspects or remainings of the hair that haven't been removed properly. I'm not sure whether it's that important when the rawhide is that thin. But well, now because I want to use this as a front and a back side, I have to take care that I pick a good corner. Now we're gonna leave it in this position flip it over, apply some skin glue on both sides because otherwise it's not sure whether it will stick. Then we'll roll it up slowly. We gotta take care that no air bubbles remain beneath the two layers because otherwise it wouldn't be connected properly and then it would move on those spots and the base coat we're gonna apply in the next step would then break off over time. We've got a lot of tricks and hacks I'm gonna show you on how to achieve that though but my hands will be full of glue all the time so no promises here. You gotta hurry up because the skin glue is a gluten glue and when it gets below a certain temperature it isn't movable anymore and you need to reheat it. I'm gonna get you closer again to show you one of the air bubbles. You see that here? How are we gonna remove it now? First I'm trying to push it in one direction. Let's see. Ah, a bit remained. Now I try to push it towards me. You can see how it moves. Maybe that way, because we've got some in that, in that direction anyway. See that? Yeah. Now let's look at it from the side again. You see how it reflects a bit strange here in that area. And when I press, you can feel it moving too. That's why we push it to the other side. The rawhide I usually use isn't transparent. This is a really good one to start with. Now we flip it put it to the other side and now we use the skin glue again. I think till here will be enough for this and again move it towards us very gently. I think now I'm gonna go full in. Now we want to flip it around the edges properly and therefore we need to cut the excess. We'll go from easy to difficult now, and that's why we'll start with this side here. And we're gonna put a lot of skin glue on it, again, on both parts and the edge. And now we push it completely over the side, of course without air bubbles. And now it gets held in place by its own tension. Let's repeat it for the bottom and the top. Apply a lot of the skin glue and flip it over. There we go. And now we are at the difficult part. We'll need to make some cuts here and here in order to snuggle it around properly. You can see we've got the end here. So we're gonna cut straight towards it first. <sighs> that was a really bad cut. <laughs> now I'm gonna repeat that a few centimeters further down. We're already getting way closer. Maybe we'll need one in this part here too. Let's try to make the connection without one first. Again, we peel it back. Now I'm gonna let my hand rest here a bit till the glue cools down. Maybe it'll stay in place then already that I'm working on the other edge here. Nearly worked perfectly on the first try. <laughs> it's the first time it works that good. I consider myself very lucky. Now let's go to the back. The first thing we want to do is to secure the front side correctly. So let's basically repeat what we made on the front. Okay, maybe let's make a cut here. I think two should be better. Let's just apply a bit of force. 
crap. I'm afraid I cut it a bit too short here, but be it as it is. Can't change it now. We only got that edge left here. Normally this part makes a lot of trouble, but I think cutting it a bit deeper was a good solution. Again, let me rest it in place a bit. Make some properly good ordered folds. If you want, you could also make cuts, but if the raw height is that thin, I think we don't need them. And then we can start with the main piece of the back. Before we now attach the main back piece, we want to give it an even look. So we're just gonna cut it straight. After cutting off the edge, I want the seam to run in the crevices here. So let's just be very gentle and consistent. Now pray to God that I didn't estimate wrong and we've got enough left. Oh yeah, that looks very, very good. Now we'll just repeat what we did on the front, but with one or two changes. And yes, we are just gluing skin with skin glue. <laughs> they are just made for each other. While putting on the end layer, we have to make sure that the folds all lie down correctly with no air trapped inside. Now we got it locked in place and can cut out the rough shape. We had some bubbles here, that's why I removed it further than necessary. Munch some skin glue into there. Don't forget that. And now we place the folds where we want them to stay and make sure that there's no air left here in the beginning. And there we go. I think a light clamp should keep that in place here. But now we trapped some air under it. So make sure that this is out before applying the clamp. Yes, it should take approximately three days till it's really dry. And then I'm gonna let it sit for another week, maybe two weeks even, because when it shrinks and the wood gets wet and dry again, it can deform in numerous ways. And that's just one of those, let's wait and see. <laughs> but before that, um, I'm gonna go over it numerous times and try to find air bubbles. And I already spotted one. And I wanna show you a small hack on how to remove it quickly. There it is. And here comes the trick. Now the air is out. Press it down a bit to make sure that we've got a connection and there we go. When you've got only uh, very little ones, like those ones for example, or those, that's not a problem. Here we've got one. There's a bit. Oh, why not? And out of every angle, you can see some new ones. And here we are, nine days later. I'm satisfied to like 80% with the rawhide so far, but I think we can get it up to 110 in quite a short amount of time. And we'll do that while the skin glue melts behind us, which we will need for the base coat. Here you can see one of the problems, which is the imprint of the clamp. And because I wanna make a very thin layer of base coat on the back, it would be visible. So let's just scratch a bit of it off. I need a box cutter knife with a longer blade. Wait a minute. Because now you see it bends a bit into the shape. And I got better chances and higher mobility. Come on. That's one of the problems with the weird shape. It keeps sliding off. The second one is you can hear. It's not touching the wood at the edge here. So that's a part we got to remove too. We don't need to be ashamed of those small folds here though. If you want, you could remove it, but I think it's okay. I think it's okay down here. Maybe flatten the edge a bit, just rub off. We got a small glue spike here. Now you can't really see it, but if you would apply the base coat, it would stick out. So, and off it goes. I think the inner parts here turned out excellent. Nice. This time I set the skin glue up with, that's what it looks dry, by the way, with 10 parts of water or nine times because I'm too lazy to calculate. Uh, so you've got 50 grams of skin glue and 450 milliliters of water in here now. And it's heated up in a water bath, which shouldn't get hotter than 60 degrees. Now we are at 50. That's quite good. Now let's see. Yeah, we are a bit below 40. 
that means it's time to add the chalk. You know, we just can't gulp it in. We've got to be very careful because if we add too much, then air would get trapped. And you would maybe think like, oh yeah, little bubbles could form. What's the problem? The problem would be that those little bubble, <laughs> that those little bubbles would persist. <gasps> And then you've got a very ugly surface because those little air pockets, they wouldn't be covered up by the paint and therefore they would just stay there, except you've got like a really thick pigment, but we'll use black and I don't think it would transmit that good. Let's very carefully add the chalk in the same amount as we've got like glue in there. So 500 milliliter, 500 gram carefully. Ah. By the way, if you ask yourself how I now know how much 500 gram will be, I just weighed the box. I got the chalk in first, like it was 660 gram, and now I'll just empty it until I have 160. Yes. And here you can see it's already forming islands. When it looks like a map of Anno, it's correct. We added all of this cold chalk. So let's just wait a bit and heat it up. Whoops. Now at the end I nearly give no pressure at all. I just gently even it out. That'll take some hours to dry now. Oh yeah, I nearly forgot it. Uh, normally you would have had an ugly overlap here. Let's just smooth it out with our fingers. Okay, but now <laughs> you probably have guessed that I don't need one kilogram for the base coat of the small shield only for the back because for the front side we will need another charge and like six days will go past till we are at the point. I made this for like three other shields. I got a base coat now so see you when we apply the black paint. I changed my mind. I think it would be best to apply the fittings first and then paint it black because of two main reasons. The first one is I don't need to attach leather directly to the surface and therefore we don't have the usual weak point where water could access through the leather directly to the not water resistant surface and the second one is that if you look at the pictures of the original it looks like the fittings also have been painted black but before that i want to show you some adjustments i did to the base coat on the back you know i want it as evenly as possible so i added like two or three more layers here we're gonna have to rub it off to get it more clearly though but that's a typical case for the box cutter knives back now we got rid of most of the problems but you know we still get those small ridges from scrapping and also we've got like very deep crevices in which we can't really enter in addition we got some very visible brush strokes so that's not that good too and that's not a problem we just can scrap off we need another trick for that to our luck it's not water resistant let's just give it a quick rub then we gotta let it dry again and it's okay you know everything what i'm telling you right now it took me years and years and like 20 shields to figure out what can be used how you could nearly call it an art <laughs> We'll also need the technique on the front for the ridges we'll add later though. You see those unevennesses here? You know, originally it took me ages to sand it down and then reapply it. And now it's just a rub with a wet sponge. This is like before. You got all the scratch marks and stuff. And this is after. Just perfectly smooth. Let's take a look at the fittings. They have been hand smithed by Tuas Schmiede again. It will be quite interesting to figure out how they were connected and with which configurations and so on. Let's just punch in the marks. Now we gotta be careful about not accidentally breaking it. <laughs> just imagine if I would hammer it in in this position. You can see the force would go to this edge and to this edge and we could break it by that. So we only want it to lie on the point where we apply the force. I decided to go with oil paint because egg tempera won't stay on the surface of the gold leaf which we will have to cover on the front and I think the same paint was used on the back so let's just get that over with quickly. Oil paint is by far the easiest paint to make. You just need pigment, in this case vine black and oil. Bam 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 bam! Now oh, come on. Black pigments are the easiest one to work with and we already got our wished result. And here we go. Three days have passed now, the paint has dried and we had some overflow on which we couldn't add another layer of base coat, so we gotta scrap that off really quick. For the front of the ridges we will use chalk of Bologna and sift it through as we did before. And that's how it's supposed to slowly go down without dragging air with it. I found another bubble below the raw height and that's how I'm gonna remove it. First cut an X on the area, fill it up with base coat and press it down for a few seconds. Ta-da!
It's far from perfect now, but I think good enough to add the ridges. And for that, we'll need another mixture, which is basically just very, very thick base coating, which consists out of two and a half times the weight of the glue. I think I got the right consistency now, which is marked by... You see that? When the ridges actually stay up. And now for the actual application, I'm going to use this squirt bottle or piping bottle. I am not sure how it's properly translated and with I am, I mean Google Translator. <laughs> I actually tried a piping bag before but it's way too difficult to handle and kind of unpredictable. Maybe a really really professional cook could do it but that doesn't include me. Mm, why doesn't it flow? Maybe it's because it cooled down on a spot. Fuck, that's never a good sign. I'm afraid if I press too hard that the top will just blow off. I'm gonna put it into the water again. That usually fixes the problem, but now you instantly can see how it gets hard. Here we go again. I can already see it's getting really difficult to press it out. So that's why I think we gotta do a quick refill and also reheaten it. Broader here. Just get as much as possible on there. Because now that we've got the bases running, we can change our strategy a bit. Now watch that. Yeah. Now you can see where we need some more. Ah! Fuck, 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 fuck this sheet. Okay, let's improvise. Let me just bring it out of the most difficult zones. You can see how it immediately stops being workable. It looks like a mess now, but it's okay at this stage. Now I only gotta see whether I've got like a similar thickness everywhere. The transition is not that nice here. Let's patch that up. It's kind of satisfying though. Okay, that looks like shit now, but if we act quick enough, it'll be perfect. Trust me, follow me on this. And in order to perform that miracle, we'll only need one of the most rarest and expensive tools there is on this earth, which is a box cutter knife. <laughs> oh, I'm so funny today. Because now you've got the consistency of jam and you can slice it perfectly. We've only got like 15 minutes on the stage now, so you should hurry up a bit. So basically we are done now with the shape, but we still need to do a bit of cleanup. Now, for example, when you can see you've got like a wiggle too much here, you can just think on which side do I have to subtract something and it's way straighter then. And you already can see how it's drying and how much harder it gets to remove it. That's it for the next 12 hours till it's dry. And don't get over enthusiastic about what we just did because there will definitely be cracks that will appear while drying. I'm gonna take a shower now, see you tomorrow. It cured for 24 hours now and as you can see, it's quite ugly. <laughs> but that's a problem we'll be able to solve in minutes, like 10 minutes maybe. You see the large cracks we've got. It got a bit away of the ground here. And of course we've got accidents all over the place. But now watch that. First, we gotta pre-wetten the thing because at the start it will soak in a lot of water. And now we're just doing that for some minutes. And you can already see how it's getting way smoother and straighter. Even after doing that, we have some remaining holes, but they can easily be closed off with the gesso we have left from yesterday.
another night has passed and I think it's looking pretty decent. Of course, we've got some smaller problems and cracks that came through again. But because we also got the spots where the rawhide's shining through, I would definitely have added another layer of base coat. That's what we're gonna do now and then we can finally start gilding. Some of you maybe asked themselves whether this kind of ornament was used on shields that went into battle too. And if yes, how resistant to beatings is it? Do you remember the piece from the beginning we made as a test? Let's see how much that can take. Okay, now something happened, but as you can see, it's still very hard and just slightly deformed. Let's try the other end now. Okay. With all that force, you still got something in here. You can also see that the wood is clearly dent in. That means that the gesso is harder than the wood. So I think that's a yes and possible. And as you can see on the shield of Seedorf, it actually got used in battle and there were also this gesso elements. They were examined in laboratory and it came out that they were exactly that what we are using here. I'm just refining the edge a bit while the glue melts and I think that's an excellent opportunity to thank you, my Patreons. If you want to join them, the link is in the description and it just means a lot to me that there are people out there who are willing to support me for watching me do what I love. Thank you so much because, you know, I'm just writing on my bachelor's degree and that's why I think I'm gonna make a short break from making videos for the next two or three months. But well, yeah, then I've got a bachelor's degree and the question is, how will I continue from there? And becoming a Patreon could definitely change my decision here. Description. By the way, don't forget to do the magical YouTube button stuff with share, liking and subscribing. And now it's time for the polymer. Thank you. Basically, I just want to mix it with water one to one, but my scale <laughs> doesn't want to help me here. So let's see whether I can guess it. I love technology. I'm just adding polymer one to one with water and then I'm going to mix it in relation of two to three with one to ten skin glue. Oh, so many numbers. Polymer gilding is quite difficult and after adding three layers of red bolus, I'm gonna explain it to you in detail. There's one last problem we gotta keep in mind before starting to copy the motive, which is called perspective. Because as you can see, if I stretch the motive out, we're nice here at the edge, everything is fine. But now imagine I wanna copy the writing part in the middle and we've got quite a large distance on the edges. That's why I think I'm gonna first like place it in the middle, copy the middle part. Then I'm gonna move the printout up a bit, copy the top part, move it down, copy the bottom part. And the method with which I'm gonna copy it is, uh, I'm just gonna glue it down here, put the carbon copy paper right in the middle where, you know, I wanna copy the stuff. And then I'm just gonna scratch it through. Uh, <laughs> like another small problem is that parts of the motive are missing up here. So I'm gonna get creative. <coughs> would be a nice opportunity for a prank like drawing a bottle of beer or something. <laughs> On some parts this technique worked quite well and I just had to add some lines in addition where I maybe missed one and on others you can see I've got a great mess with many different lines which take some seconds to understand which goes in which direction which is exactly what I wanted to avoid <laughs> Because when you're gilding with polymer, you activate the red surface with a well activating liquid, which consists out of 80% water, 20% alcohol, and you bring it on the surface where you want the gold leaf to stick. And then you've got like 10 seconds to apply it. Sounds easy, right? But if you've got so many different objects and small nifty little details, you gotta paint really, really fast and reapply it on some spots that already are too dry. So let's see how long I'll need in order to relearn it. Because I need to be so quick in applying, I always prepare the gold leaf's heft by just folding it a bit. And now I can access it much faster. You can also see if I got a fold like that. 
I just blow a bit on it and then it's okay. That's like another thing. You always have to be very careful how you breathe that you don't accidentally mess it up completely. Another good advice I can give you is that if the gilder's tip doesn't work that good anymore and won't pick up the gold leaf, just brush it upon your forehead and then it works again. Now I'm done with the main part of the gilding and before we wipe the... <coughs> <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm ill. I'll definitely go to the living room for the next step in which we will finish the shield with the painting. But before that, we have to wipe off the excess of the gold leaf. And I'm already looking out whether we've got like small holes in them because now I can cover them up easily. I just take a bit of the activating liquid, put it on the hole, pick off a bit of the excess and put it on the hole and we've got a hole less. <laughs> Before we can start painting now, we've got to remove all the loosen up gold. For that we will use a, as we say in Germany, Mikrofasertuch. And I always think that's nearly the most satisfying part from gilding. Now it's gonna get interesting. Let's see. That's the reason why I'm not doing this in my normal living room. Everything is covered in small gold leaves after that. You know, it's beautiful, but still. Now we got two kinds of holes. The first one are the type we can ignore because they are so little or will be covered up by the shading. And then of course the ones which we have to cover up. Like here you can see we've got a clear gap in one of the branches that needs to be filled in. Also, if you've got like big blank spots in the middle of a larger area, like yeah, well, this one. All in all, I'm quite satisfied, actually. I imagined it would be way worse. Now let's clean it up and we can finally start painting. But we gotta keep one thing in mind because even after the oil paint has dried, gold leaf would still stick to it. So that means once we start painting, we can't go back and do some more gilding. That's why we shouldn't miss a spot now. <laughs> <coughs> And here we are once again facing another problem because the surface is that curved that if I like mix the paint way too liquid then it would like drip down the surface. If I don't mix it liquid enough I only could do lines which are well too thick and not the very fine lines which we need for the details and for the shading. For the main part I decided to stay with the brush which I also used for the gilding. I think it just like fits the curvature that is at play here. Maybe I'll go with a finer lining brush when it comes to the very small details. But because I maybe need to make the paint very thin, uh, I decided to go with bone black instead of wine black because it's also authentic, of course, and way intenser. Let's see whether the mixture is good or whether I need a bit more oil. Looks good, but we got some particles in there, so I'm just gonna work it a bit more to get rid of the clumps. Bone black clearly was the correct idea. I look at the original and then what I got in front of my nose to make sure that I don't misinterpretate something I may be wrongly gilded before. <laughs> Now it's time to paint the letters and this is always quite difficult because you got to calculate to the millimeter exactly where you start, where the middle is and so on because otherwise you won't have enough space for the last letter or the first one. The trick with that is to start well basically in the middle and get a specific point where you know where it is. But the placement isn't the only problem because if you just wiggle a bit then it would look nasty and this shouldn't happen. You got to be very very steady with your hand when painting the letters. Press your thumbs now. I think that's like the 10th time in the project that I say that, but well, victory is in sight. Although I chose titanium white to mix the gray, I decided to go with the authentic cinnabar red, which is kind of poisonous, like very poisonous to be honest, but it's just those little four or five letters. So I don't think that it would be like that large of an amount. Uh. 
Yes! Now don't damage it, don't overdo it. Crap, I forgot to turn my microphone on. Okay. <laughs> Before we can take a look at the final result now, I have to make a confession because I kind of lied to you at the start. I didn't make a museum replica with all the historical authentic stuff. I made two. One of those two beauties is already sold, but the other one isn't, so if you're interested, get in touch. Thank you for watching now. If you want to see me crafting another awesome historical authentic replica, this time only one, I promise, take a look at that video. And if you want to see me crafting a shield you can actually use for fighting, which is a bit more easier to make with modern day materials, take a look at this one. See you there. Bye bye.